Hi everybody and welcome to our introduction to the idea of electrolysis. Now I'm going to warn you in advance, this video is probably going to get a little bit on the long side because I want to introduce the idea of electrolysis but I also want to show you two example problems all in the same sort of lesson so that we get some of the basic ideas of electrolysis all in one shot. So electrolysis is sort of the opposite of everything we've done up to this point. Up to this point, we've zeroed in on spontaneous chemistry that produces a voltage that we harness into things like a galvanic cell or we engineer cleverly into packages like batteries. Now we're going to go in the opposite direction. Instead of looking at spontaneous chemistry that produces a potential, we're going to use a potential to do some chemistry. So really what we're going to be looking at in one way is sort of the stoichiometric analysis of electrochemistry because we're going to really talk about converting moles of one thing into moles of another thing not unlike what you've learned in freshman chemistry when you did stoichiometry except we're going to put it in the context of electrochemistry. So there are really going to be sort of three types of electrolysis challenges that we're going to meet during the course of doing electrolysis problems. So the three levels are set up more or less like this. The first kind of challenge we're going to have to look at is a fairly straightforward stoichiometric calculation where we know what we have to start with and we know what we're trying to form. So there's only going to be one potential product that we can make and we want to figure out how much of that product we're going to make. So that's a fairly straightforward stoichiometric calculation. You don't really have to um, know electrochemistry in any great detail in order to do those kinds of calculations. The other two levels will actually require some knowledge of electrochemistry because in the other two levels we're not going to necessarily know going into the problem what's going to be possible. We'll actually have to determine a various possible redox options, we have to identify the one that is going to be thermodynamically the most likely to occur, then we go ahead and do the calculation based on the thermodynamic most likely to occur option. And that'll be within systems that, as I'm writing here, are non-aqueous. So we don't have ions in an aqueous solution, but somehow we're still doing electrolysis on them. Then the third level is going to be similar to the second in that there are going to be multiple options. I could have one of any of two or three possible reactions occurring at my cathode and my anode in addition to having now the variable of water be in the system because water itself is electrochemically active and we need to account for that in many cases when we pass a current through an aqueous system. All right, so options two and three here, challenges two and three are going to be electrochemically a little bit more complicated, but we'll work through it, whereas option one, which is what I'm going to focus in on in the next two practice problems, um, is going to be a little bit more straightforward. So I'm going to shrink and move my three levels of electrolysis challenges maybe up there, hopefully that'll give me enough white space. And we're going to take a look at these two problems that I've got down here on the bottom left and right. And I'm going to start with the one here on the left first. Okay, So we want to know how long it's going to take to plate out or produce on the electric. When we say plate out, what we mean is that some um, elemental metal material is being formed on the surface of the cathode electrode. So that's what plating out means. It sticks to the surface of the electrode. So how long is it going to take to produce on the electrode, plate out, a kilogram of aluminum? If we have an aqueous solution of aluminum plus 3, we're going to use a current of 100 amps. So we're introducing the idea of current, and uh, we'll see how current um, factors into our stoichiometric calculation that we're going to do. All right, so... Let's pick blue here, let's grab the pen icon, and I'm going to start doing some writing here. So it's going to be helpful, of course, to know what the chemistry is that you're doing. So in this case, we're taking aqueous aluminum plus 3, and I'm going to leave off the phase labels just to give myself plenty of room, and that's going to get reduced 
at the cathode by three electrons to form elemental aluminum. Here I'll put elemental solid there so it's clear that we're forming elemental aluminum. So what I want to know is how much time it's going to take me to do this particular chemistry if I want to make a kilogram of elemental aluminum and I'm using a current of 100 amps. So these turn out to be basically factor label problems or dimensional analysis problems. Um, and you should be comfortable doing this. You've been doing this since freshman year, if not, um, if not sooner. So let me show you the factor label analysis that we need to do here. Okay? So I want to make one kilogram. Well, one kilogram is also known as a thousand grams. So I'm going to make a thousand grams of aluminum. All right. Well, aluminum, uh, obviously in chemistry we don't do calculation based on grams. We do it based on moles. So uh, one mole of aluminum has a molar mass of what is it? It's like 27. It's 26.98 grams. So that'll get me into moles of aluminum. In order to form a mole of aluminum, I need to consume three moles of electrons. So these stoichiometric calculations in electrolysis will always have a ratio of moles of electrons to moles of material, material Excuse me, you're trying to form or you're consuming. So I'm going to have here, for every mole of aluminum that I produce, I need to consume three moles of electrons. Now that we've got moles of electrons, perhaps this might uh, get you thinking, well, moles of electrons, in what other context, what other quantity in electrochemistry have you seen that deals with moles of electrons? Well, how about the charge on the mole of an electron, right? Faraday's constant, 96,485 coulombs is the charge of one mole of electron. All right, so if we start to do maybe some of the factor labeling so far, we see that the grams of aluminum cancel, the moles of aluminum cancel, the moles of electrons cancel, and right now I have coulombs. And what I need to get to, as you can see in the problem, I need to get to time, right? How long will it take? So what unit do I have that combines time and charge and coulombs? Well, that's where the current comes in. So I'm now going to then use the fact that I have a current of 100 amps. So every second I'm passing 100 coulombs through this electrolytic cell, right? 100 amps is 100 coulombs per second, right? It's a measure of the current. So then we see that the coulombs cancel, and I'm left with the units of seconds, which is great for a unit if I want to calculate time. So if you do um, the, the calculation here, you see that you're going to have, if we disregard sig figs here for a moment, 107,285 seconds, and maybe we convert that into something that's a little bit more useful, and with a little bit of care to sig figs, that's about 29.8 hours. So in a little bit longer than a day, you can make a kilogram of aluminum from an aqueous solution of aluminum 3 if you're passing 100 amps through it. Okay, So that's sort of level one of the problems that we're going to look at. You know we're making aluminum, you know we're making it from aluminum 3, you know the current, so it's a fairly straightforward dimensional analysis, factor label type stoichiometry problem. Now, if we taught a little bit of electrochemistry to freshmen, excuse me, we could get freshmen to do this kind of problem. It's not that complicated. All right, so let's maybe uh, pick it up just a little bit. I'm going to shrink my work down here, shrink this down, and I'm going to get these guys out of my way because I'm going to do the next level of problem, and that is this guy over here. I guess I should rephrase. I'm not doing the next level of problem. I'm still kind of at level one where we're doing fairly straightforward stoichiometric calculations, but I'm just going to do a slightly more elaborate version of this. All right, so here in this problem, we have molten KF that's going to get electrolyzed. Let me grab my pointer. Molten KF that's going to get electrolyzed. Why am I specifying that it's molten? Well, 
in order for a current to pass through a ionic material, that ionic material needs to be able to flow. So I'm going to melt my potassium fluoride. But I don't want to do level 2 of the, or level 3 of the problems yet because I don't want to have any water in the system. So there's no water in this system. So it's going to be a little bit easier to deal with. Okay, so molten KF. If I have molten KF, molten potassium fluoride, what I really have floating around is potassium plus and fluoride minus. That's what I really have. So then my cathode reaction, and I'll just abbreviate that with a C, what's going to happen at the cathode? Am I going to play with the potassium ion at the cathode or the fluoride ion at the cathode? Well, using a little chemistry common sense, right? the cathode is where reduction occurs. And the thing that I can reduce easier is the cation. So my cathode reaction is potassium plus, plus an electron to form elemental potassium. And my anode chemistry is going to be the oxidation of the fluoride. Right? The fluoride is going to get oxidized to, and I'll just balance it this way, a half a mole of F2 plus an electron. All right? I balanced the anode reaction using a half so that my moles of electrons in the cathode compartment and the anode compartment are both uh, equal, are both one in this particular case. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure out how much fluorine gas I'm going to be producing at my anode compartment, in my anode compartment. All right, so I'm passing 10 amps for two hours, and it's all happening at 25 degrees and 1 atm. So let's start doing some factor label fun. So I'm going to have two hours, and let's see, I want to convert that ultimately into seconds because I'm going to have to play with the current, which is also in seconds. So I know that an hour is the equivalent of 36 hundred seconds. So that'll get me from hours to seconds. I'm passing 10 coulombs per second from the current that I specified in the problem. And I know that one mole of electrons has a charge of 96,485 coulombs. And I know that my ratio of moles of electrons Every time I give off one mole of electron, I'm also giving off a half a mole of fluorine. So then I have 0.5 moles of F2. All right, so let's do the factor labeling. The hours cancel, the seconds cancel, the coulombs cancel, the moles of electrons cancel, and I'm left with moles of F2. And in this case, that's going to come out to be uh, 0 0.373 moles of F2. And I want to get the volume, so I'm going to use the ideal gas equation, right? So I'm going to use PV equals nRT, and I'm going to solve that for the volume. And I'm not going to plug in all the numbers here, but if you solve this for volume, right? So we put in the moles we just calculated, 0.0821 for the gas constant, uh, 298 in Kelvin for our temperature, divided by the 1 atm pressure, and you'll see that the volume we get here is going to be 9.12 liters of F2 gas. So that's the amount of fluorine that's going to be produced in the cathode. I also asked you to solve for the mass of the potassium. And I could go through another factor label analysis using the half reaction in the cathode. Or I could be clever about this, right? Since I made sure that the, my moles of electrons were balanced, then my two half reactions are balanced with respect to each other. So if I produce 0 0.373 moles of F2 gas, right, if I produce that much F2 gas, my ratio of fluorine to potassium is a half to one. Or, put more easily, I form twice as much potassium, twice as many moles of potassium, as I form fluorine. So, if I have 0.373 moles of fluorine gas, 
then my moles of potassium is going to be equal to twice the moles of fluorine, which is 0 0.746 moles of potassium. Then go ahead and multiply that by the molar mass of potassium, which is about 39.1 grams per mole, and we'll see that this then tells us we're going to have, uh, let's see, what is it? It's about 29.2 grams of potassium. So there's my, my other answer. So I know the um, volume of fluorine, and I know the mass of potassium that's produced. So here are a couple of examples, again, of level one type problems. We know what we're going to make. We knew going in we were going to make potassium. We knew we were going to make fluorine. We do the associated factor label analysis to get the uh, problem solving done. In the next set of videos, we're going to take it up a notch. We're going to have systems where there are multiple options that could be formed in the anode and or the cathode, and we have to use our understanding of electrochemistry to first identify what product is going to be formed, and then we can do more factor labeling to actually uh, calculate quantities. All right, so that's the first bit of electrolysis. I realize this was a long video, but I did want to package in the intro and some initial problem solving all in at once. We'll keep talking about electrolysis in the upcoming videos.